Uh, right, hello everybody. Uh, this is quite new for me. Um, if we're playing 10 year bingo, then uh, I win because I've been in the inkjet industry three months really. <coughs> uh, so, the perfect person to be the CEO of GIS and to tell you all about inkjet. So, um, but actually, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit differently. Um, as some of you might know, GIS has gone through a, a change in the, in the past 12 months. Uh, so I'm going to talk about what we're doing, what we're going to be doing, and um, why it's interesting to me. So uh, my background, just for a, a bit of a heads up, is in radio frequency design. So I'm actually an electronic engineer by, by trade, 30 years in security and defence. So when I told everybody I'm going to go and work in inkjet, most of my colleagues said, why? Uh, it's just printing. That's boring. They couldn't have been more wrong, is the, uh, the truth. And uh, despite the glucose lull I'm feeling in the room at the moment, I'm going to try and revive you uh, with some exciting electronics. So what's happened to GIS? Well, um, as you can see, I'm now the CEO. Uh, but in January, we were acquired by a company called NanoDimension, who are a world leader in additive manufacture and additive manufacture for electronics. Um, they were founded in 2014 and we're a NASDAQ listed company. We've got about 230 R&D engineers in total of which about 25-30% of those are in our offices in Cambridge at GIS. Um, most of you will probably know Nick Geddes I suspect who founded GIS several years ago uh, and I still work very closely with him um, although he's now moved on to be the CTO of Nano Dimension itself. So of all the divisional companies in the group. Um, we've got 72 staff in Cambridge in total, and we're becoming a, a software and hardware R&D centre for, for Nano Dimension, as well as continuing to do all the GIS software, data path electronics, and uh, ink systems that most people probably know us for. Uh, and over the next year, we're probably going to grow by about 30% in terms of size of facilities and people um, to accommodate the work that we're moving into now. So why have we become part of Nano Dimension? Well, primarily our expertise in, in data path electronics. Uh, and that's being pulled together with um, Nano's own expertise in the machine building for additive manufacturing and then bringing together Semtec with their pick and place uh, capability, Admatec who do ceramic deposition, and then DeepCube who are um, machine learning uh, mathematics group who uh, help with the software to bring all that together. And I'll explain a bit more about that later. But the intention is to pull all of these together so we can manufacture, in the first instance, electronic systems in one machine in one process. <coughs> I'm not going to spend too much time on this. If, if I want somebody to explain this, I'll ask Mark Bale probably to stand up and, and give a much better explanation than I could ever do, as he has given to me in the past few weeks. Um, but this is what fascinates me, because until I'd actually come into the world of inkjet, I didn't realise how difficult it actually is to just put some dots on a piece of paper or a piece of plastic uh, or in fact, as we're doing now, uh, different types of fluids contain, which are either dielectric inks, uh, metallic inks, all sorts of fluids, uh, a range of viscosities onto a substrate. And in the case of what we're trying to do now is build three-dimensional substrates. The benefit is, because we're laying down in a three-dimensional form, the substrates and, and uh, materials, we can build electronic structures that previously were not possible. And that's the key thing that Inkjet has enabled right now, is this ability to build a three-dimensional structure. So from my point of view as an electronic designer, this is something that I've been waiting 30 years for. Um, the, the key thing that's always been uh, important is making things small, efficient, cheap, I remember when I, I came to Cambridge, I moved to Cambridge about 26 years ago. 
uh, against the best advice of my father, who said, I don't know why you're going to work on mobile phones, because they're a complete waste of time. They'll never take off. Uh, and sure enough, they didn't. Um, not in my house. Um, but um, yeah, the, 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 um, the technology to make things smaller has, you know, in recent years been driven by the mobile phone market. But there are many other areas which people don't see. So in vehicles, defence and security applications, you know, there's a project called the Dismounted Soldier, which is about making it for those who've served or know people in the military. They have to carry a heck of a weight of stuff and trying to make these things small, body shaped, etc., to make their job easier is just one aspect, as well as fitting electronics into the dashboard of a car. But the good thing is we can go from kind of traditional PCB structures, which are 2D and planar, to these AME-based technologies <laughs> where we can pick and place components at all sorts of angles. We can build circuits which are not planar in structure, but built up of layers. They're a solid block, and there's no restrictions on the thicknesses in those blocks no specific layers. You can design pretty much what you want. If you can draw it in CAD, you can probably make it. And that's, for, for me as a, a design engineer, that's what's really important. So why, why are we moving this way? Well, as I've said, we, we've talked about the, the size of things, but one of the key things is speed, speed of manufacture and speed to market, time to market. Quite often I'd be designing something in the lab, draw it up, it goes away to be made for several weeks, comes back, and okay, we're all used to paralyzing those kind of projects, but now we can make uh, a complete assembly in a matter of hours, uh, typically four hours. Uh, and that's substrate down, components on, ready to power up. Um, as I said, it helps reduce the size and weight and power, Power obviously becoming more and more critical as resources become ever more depleted. Um, and not just for defence, the, these are just the markets, but when you're trying to design some of these, uh, the, <coughs> these components and, and systems, often you're having to work with somebody and show the IP you're generating while you're building those. And it, being able to have one of these machines in-house and build it yourself allows you to um, allows you to keep more confidential the work that you're, you're doing. Um, as I've said, time to market. Uh, biomedical, the, the advances in the way we um, approve medical devices is, is increasing. We can also jet fluids that can go directly into the body that are uh, not, uh, what's the word, not, not uh, aggressive in terms of contact with skin or your internal organs. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, a, there's another set of inks that you can jet to produce uh, products. Uh, and then, you know, there's many other smart, smart IoT, all those buzzwords that come to nothing generally, but um, uh, all these devices that people want to make, uh, you can make them quickly. In small volumes at the moment, I'll say that um, 3D printing, AME, AM, are not huge volume manufacturing technologies right now, but they will be very soon. And just as an example of, you know, this is, this is what we're trying to build with, with our machines. We're, we're able to build a complete 3D structure at micron level geometries um, with submicron accuracy of placement. Um, and, and put the design into the machine and out pops this three-dimensional object which you can just fit into something else. And it's inkjet has been the lead technology in helping that happen. But, the, but inkjet is just one tiny part of the process. There's obviously multiple deposition technologies. Um, there's multiple other technologies that you can pull together to build this complex system of electronics that we're looking to manufacture. But the thing that GIS and Nano have realised is that uh, there's more, you know, th there's more to this ecosystem than, than just the printhead part. We need to build software. Oh, 
blank. We need to build software uh, that's hardware agnostic. We've got great, expect, uh, great, expect, great expertise in the processes and how to pull the technologies together, but we don't design all the electronics. So we need to work with partners who have got vision systems, other data path electronics, um, sensing technologies, all of these things to pull them together into this inkjet printer to be able to build any number of different types of application. So we have to be adaptable to lots of different material processes. The software we design is fully configurable so that it can work around all those processes and be, have a bespoke UI for the people uh, that, that ultimately can use the product. Um, and as I've said, we're working with lots of different systems because there's a lot of control needed in this inkjet machine. We all know how important temperature, humidity, etc., is. Um, so we have to sense all those and pull that together. And I'll come back to where that all comes into one place. Um, data path electronics, well, obviously we're experts in that. But not just for inkjet now, we have to be able to jet all sorts of fluids. And we're, we, you know, we're, we're certainly working on the, the standard inks, which are up to about 30 centipoise, I think is typical. But we're also working on fluids up to 100 centipoise which require different waveforms, different heads, different technologies to, to jet them. But also, again, coming back to the, the eco side of things, we needed to be power efficient. We don't want to be burning, electron, uh, burning electricity just for the sake of it. But also, while we're doing all that, it's quite costly to build a lot of these systems and we need to have what's called BITE, built-in test equipment. So we're monitoring everything all the time and highlighting whenever there's a fault because downtime is money. And then with the ink systems, lastly, um, we're working on a range of, of system volumes from 100 millilitres up to maybe 500 millilitres in the, in the header tanks. But some of the inks that you're using for, uh, or fluids I'd rather call them, for um, AME and AM can be $10,000 a litre or more. So you can't afford to waste them. You don't want them in huge reservoir systems because you'll waste it. They can be wasted when you're draining them off or just flushing it through. So small volume ink systems are critical to that. So we're working on those. And that's been, you know, so more efficient, smaller ink systems have been driven by the need for the fluids and the heads that we're using right now. Similarly, pumps, you can imagine inks with uh, silver, copper, etc., in a highly abrasive. So we're working with pump manufacturers to come up with better pumps and help them design better pumps, longer lasting pumps. At pumps from a few years ago, with some of the fluids we use now, might only last a few days, whereas we're now getting to pumps which are gonna last many months. Um, and again, diag diagnostics. One thing I have seen uh, with uh, some customers is when a, when a pump blows or a pipe comes off, and the ink goes everywhere. I'd never thought about it before, but the sad faces you see when there's just ink to be cleaned up and somebody with a rag just walking up to the machine, uh, that, that's a, that is a sad sight. So um, you want to know before that happens. So we're putting in all the diagnostics to cope with that as well, uh, because these aggressive fluids are, you know, they're, they're uh, particle heavy and um, things are gonna fail quicker in, in a lot of cases. And as I've said, downtime is lost revenue. But what brings this all together and is, and is one of the key skills that we've got is this is a big data problem ultimately. You've got heads and all the monitoring and temperature, you know, temperatures, the data path you can use to monitor the head. We've got pumps, we've got uh, temperature sensors, pressure sensors, humidity sensors, all these things from all the machines and you need to bring those together and teach the system when is it going to fail. And you do that not with AI, because AI doesn't exist, we all know that. AI at the moment is really just complex statistics and deep learning. Uh, the difference between machine learning and deep learning, for those that don't know, is machine learning is basically you train an algorithm on a set of data and that's it, and it just learns off that data. Deep learning, you need a neural network, 
a more complex mathematical system which will keep learning and that's what we use in our software. Um, we don't, it's mostly deep learning. Um, and it just monitors and learns the system. You have to, the, the, the one thing you do need to see is failure. You can't teach something when it fails unless you see it fail. So it's important to have failures, but the system can learn off those. And we are building software which is agnostic to all of our hardware, uh, and in fact can be interfaced with anybody's hardware to learn about when failures occur, when to predict service intervals, rather than you have to do it every month or every week or every six months, it will tell you when it's necessary. Because coming back to the previous slide, downtime is money. So the future, somebody I think in the previous session before the break said, automation is the future and it definitely is, um, especially for volume manufacture. Um, Obviously, it's in there now, but we're moving into, um, into the, the realm of machines that are going to completely build what you want rather than build the piece parts and they'd be put together. And the only way you're going to do that is, is with automation. Um, closed loop systems are, are obviously the way to do that. And we're using machine vision at the moment to uh, analyze nozzles, nozzle out, uh, misdirected jetting, uh, head lifetimes, rotation of images to correct that so you can put things through at odd angles. Um, we're doing feed forward power management to look after the heating of not just the head, but the whole environment. Uh, we're also looking at predictive maintenance um, because of the, as I've said, the cost of, of the ink. Uh, and essentially we're trying to build this sustainable, I hate the word, but it's the word that everybody uses, sustainable ecosystem. Um, basically, we're just trying to minimise power, material used and waste, and also be able to recycle everything we make. And that's what we're doing with the inks that we're creating in-house. So, just to summarise with using the benefit of my three months, inkjet is only a small part of the solution. Um, and full process understanding is essential. Looking at one part is definitely not enough. You've got to understand the whole process from start to finish. And gathering the big data to do that makes a difference. You can, see, uh, you can clearly see patterns when you start to look at multiple machines, multiple applications, it becomes very clear. And machine learning and deep learning is the key to that uh, success. And at the end, the goal is to manufacture, as I said, complex products with less material in shorter times and let's make it environmentally friendly too. Thanks. <laughs>